Boy, I love making things simple rather than complicated. Love it. Let's go over one fact that is undeniable. Every branch of science or so-called science throughout history has done one thing consistently. Always and in all ways. They've always thought that their crap is accurate. Every single branch of physics Today, 30 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 200, 300, it's all the same. They've all thought their crap was accurate, and they've always been proven wrong. Absolutely every time. Do you think anybody understands what magnetism is or how a magnet works? Nope. Well, one person does. I do. I've spent many, many years on it, and I've finally figured it out, and it's irrefutable. I'll stake my life on it, and I'll debate it in front of anybody on the face of this planet. How does modern general relativity and quantum mechanics explain magnetism? Well, let's quote Richard Feynman. He's got a very famous video where he sits and squirms and wiggles and squirms in his chair. Like you've asked him, I mean, how many skeletons he's got in his basement, and he, he says, well, it's too, too complicated for me to explain to you. However, he does explain it, he actually doesn't dis explain it, in his book, QED, Strange Theory of Light and Matter. And the current scientific explanation for instantaneous action at a distance, i.e. magnetism, i.e. how a field operates, is virtual particles. Well, what's a virtual particle? Well, they don't exist. They're not the inputs or outputs of any experimentation, and they themselves will admit, quote-unquote, virtual particles are created to balance out equations. Why? That's no different than saying unicorns or leprechauns, or that which mediates fields and magnetism. It's ridiculous. They've also reified space. Let's quote uh, Nikola Tesla on Einstein. Einstein is a beggar wrapped in purple robes whom ignorant folks take for the king. The theory that he said, these theories are wrapped in errors and fallacies, like clothes in a, ma ma uh, a magnificent mathematical garb which fascinates, dazzles, and bl makes people blind to the underlying errors. This theory of relativity is like a beggar in purple clothes who the ignorant people take for a king. To say that in the presence of large bodies, space becomes curved is equivalent to stating that something can act upon nothing. Since action and reaction are coexistence, it follows that the supposed curvature of space, a la Einstein, is absolutely impossible. He goes on and on. He says of the theory of relativity, it's a mass of errors and deceptive ideas violently opposed to the great teaching of men of science of the past and even to common sense. Too bad Sir Isaac, this is a poem that Tesla wrote, Too bad Sir Isaac Newton, they dimmed your renown and turned your great science upside down. Now a long-haired crank, Einstein by name, put your high teachings to blame. He says that matter and force are uh, transmutable and wrong are the laws that you taught. I am much too ignorant, my son, for grasping at such crazy schemes so finely spun. Ah, uh, my conclusions differ from Einstein's to the extent that they disprove Einstein's theory. My explanations of natural phenomena are not so involved as his. They are simpler, and when I am ready to make a full announcement, it will be seen that I have proven my conclusions. I want to talk about the two things really quickly that scares the living piss. All you have to do is run across the best minds in general relativity, quantum mechanics, and all you have to do is ask them about two things. And they will stutter and piss themselves and scratch their ass and stammer or they'll give you some sort of BS response to dazzle you like throwing uh, glitter in your eyeballs. Just ask them what one or two things are. Ask them to denote them. In other words, define them. They cannot. They never will. Instantaneous action at a distance and the word field, or in Greek, koros. They can't do it. Why? Because quantum mechanics and general relativity 
is nothing different than ancient Greek atomism. The premise is that the entire universe is a bunch of rolling microscopic BBs, most of which are invisible, and it's just like a, a rain stick. There's nothing but a bunch of rolling particles around, subatomic and otherwise, and everything is mediated by particles. But they know that's not true ultimately because they know that fields are particle free and then if things are particles and instantaneous action at a distance, which we know does occur obviously, has nothing to do with particles. Because obviously they'll be traveling faster than light and according to GR and QM, nothing can travel faster than light. Oh, well they've got a magical unicorn explanation for that. They've got time traveling particles and all... Their premise is that Mother Nature is an insane crack whore. Okay? That is the premise, irreducibly so, that quantum mechanics and general relativity forward is that Mother Nature is an insane crack whore. They have absolutely no empirical data to prove anything regarding general relativity or quantum mechanics as regards the denotation or even the connotation of the word field. They cannot denote the word field. It is impossible for them. Nobody has ever defined field. I'm actually working on the book for the term field. It's just so simplex. So let's look at their explanation. In physics, a field is a physical quantity. It is? No, it isn't. There's no physicality to field. There's no physicality to magnetism. That's nonsense. That has a value for every point in space and time. Space and time are not points. Space and time. Time is a qualifier of the, uh, the movement between bodies. Time is a qualifier, a post-attributional quality of space. And space itself, by the way, there are no fields that terminate in space. Space cannot be a terminus for anything. Space is neither a field nor a force. It, just as Tesla said, can act on the... Tesla didn't say these exact words, they're my words. Space can act on nothing and it does nothing. It has no attributes. That does quote Tesla, however. For example, on a weather map, a surface velocity is described as a vector on a map. Each vector represents a field or movement at that point. An electric field can be thought of as a condition in space. Space can have no conditions. Space is, space is the attributional after effect of the loss of inertia. I'll show it to you really simple here in a second. It's just so simple. You've got two premises. You can believe general relativity and quantum mechanics for which they have no empirical evidence whatsoever. Or you can understand that Mother Nature, just to use the term loosely, is extremely simplex and divine. As I said, every branch of science has never deferred from the fact that they've always thought that their crap was right. And every time, every time, they've always been proven wrong. You want to know the other big secret of general relativity? The one word that they hate the most now, they can never define instantaneous action at a distance or field. Never. Never. Never, never, never. But the one word that they hate most and yet still use is this one, ether. The Michelson-Morley experiment never disproved ether, by the way. Never. Absolutely. General relativity and quantum mechanics still use this, but they are unable to use this. This is like some stupid redneck from the 30s coming into the future and throwing around the n-word. In general relativity, in quantum mechanics, this is like some stupid redneck blurting out the n-word. Okay, just pure and simple as an analogy. You use the word ether amongst these mental midget scumbags of pseudoscience and their virtual particles. You say ether, everybody turns their head around and goes, what? Yet they still use this. All they've done is renamed it. You know what they're calling it now? There's a few different things they're calling it. The favorite phrase now, because they know that fields and instantaneous action and distance have nothing to do with particles. And of course they will admit that 70% of the universe is a big unknown to them. Yet they've still particularized it by calling it DM, dark matter. Matter, i.e. particles. Well, we don't know what it is, we're just calling it dark matter. We don't know what it is, but that's what we're going to call it. But here is what they call the ether now. Because they know that none of their models can work without the ether, but they can't use the word ether. Because that is the giant, excuse my analogy, the giant N-word. You know, it's just like, oh, oh my god, you didn't say that word, did you? No, I don't use that word, I'm just using it analogously, okay? They're calling it this. This is what the assholes of uh, general relativity 
have replaced for the word ether. Quantum fluid. That's the new that's the new magic term for ether. We can't say ether anymore, so we're going to say quantum fluid. Quantum. <laughs> this is nothing other than a cover word for ether. Instantaneous action in a fields are particle free. There are no particles in a field. Even the morons of general relativity and quantum mechanics know this for a fact. They're idiots. Just huge, de demented scumbag. They have denoted magnetism as being mediated up by virtual particles. There is no quantitative difference between saying virtual particles, which have never been observable outputs or inputs of any experiment. It is a total phantasm created in the minds of these atomistic idiots. It doesn't exist. There's no difference between saying that and unicorns and leprechauns or what causes and mediates and uh, controls. It, there's no difference. No quantitative difference whatsoever. They'll go on to say, well, a field can be classified as a scalar field of... There is never an explanation from anybody. The way you scare the piss not out of anybody that thinks that they understand science. It's a la field theory. It's just to ask them about instantaneous action at a distance and ask them to define the word field. Say, since fields are particle free, define the word field. They won't. They'll say, well, field is like a region of in an influence of what? Space. Well, space is neither a force. Okay. It can't act on anything. Space is neither a force nor a field. It can't act on anything. You can't reify one with the other. It doesn't work. It's absolutely impossible. By the way, what's the easiest way to describe what the earliest AC generators were? Here we have a magnet. doesn't matter which pole it is. Here we have the DIP, the dielectric inertial plane. We have magnetic reciprocation north to south. We obviously have a necessitated uh, rarefaction and compression. Dielectric inertial plane is in the middle. You know what a dielectric reflector is? Well, it's a copper coil. So what's an AC generator in essence? The most simplex variety. With a spinning magnet in the center and we have a coil here. Let's just call this a one phase coil. What's the simplest explanation of what an AC motor is in its earliest, earliest variety? It is nothing other than an inverted magnet. Here we have the centrifugal divergent magnetism moving in space and time which necessitates phase induction of the dielectric inertia plane. Remember, copper, any sort of coil, is a dielectric reflector, okay? So here you have an inverse magnet. Here we have the dielectric inertia plane and a natural magnet in the center. Over here we have the dielectric inertia plane on the outside. Here we have the reciprocating magnetism, i.e. the force and motion. We have force and motion going on in the magnet, but it's also uh, varied in respect to time because we know that an AC generator we're spinning the magnet inside the copper coil. This is a really simplex AC generator, okay? Real simplex power generator. Okay, and here we have the dielectric reflector, copper coil. The only thing an AC motor is versus a magnet is an inverted magnet, an inside out magnet. It is that simple. Oh my god, I wish someone told me this 20 years ago. What is an AC motor? Why it's an inside out magnet. All you have to do is vary the reciprocating phased centrifugal divergent magnetism with respect to time. Just hook a drive shaft right here. Hook it up to turning water or you know, wind, whatever. Vary it with respect to time, closely against the dielectric reflector, not yet copper coil, and you have power generation. Okay? That's simple. Now I could tell you something about what you could do to magnets using compression, but that's for another video. Anyway, check for part two. I'm going to talk about uh, inertia versus force in motion. Catch you there.